Hello, we're rolling into another episode of the DRH show. As usual, I talk to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well being. Today, I'll be talking to a returning guest who is an expert in mental health. Just to give you a bit of a context, today is Friday, 27th of, Mar 27th of March, and we're in the middle of the coronavirus crisis. So this time, my returning guest will be sharing his expertise and insights in relation to the crisis that we're going through. Dr. Mark Halterhoff, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Okay, um, as I've mentioned, it's already your second time here. But um, just for the benefit of those who's watching us for the first time, could you just give us your background, tell us who you are, where you're from, and just, just give us your trajectory in, in life on how you ended up becoming a mental health researcher. Okay. Um, well, I am a lecturer in clinical psychology at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I'm also a practitioner psychologist and um, originally from the U.S. and practiced both in private practice settings and in NGOs and have also done some work doing, um, you know, counseling and psychotherapy and consulting here in the UK. Um, so my trajectory really has been starting as a practitioner um, and then kind of going into academia and then going into research more specifically. And my, my focus really at the University of Edinburgh has been on looking at issues along of like resilience and kind of really developing a strengths-based or positive psychology perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I'm personally influenced uh, very strongly by a positive psychology framework, uh, which just really basically means that, you know, although we acknowledge things like mental mm -hmm. illness and all sorts of struggles that people face, ultimately we want to see about positive functioning and healthy functioning. So we want to understand how people learn to thrive and how to flourish and how to uh, live an abundant life and to really experience um, not just coping and surviving, um, which I think is, of course, a really, um, I think, crucial thing to think about these days, but going beyond just coping and surviving, but actually feeling like you have a, um, a good life. And that doesn't mean that you're happy all the time. That doesn't mean that you um, never had any problems. It just means that you, you strongly have the strengths and the assets and the skills and the abilities to face the challenges that you have. And so it's a form of resilience and, um, and strength, really. And so mm -hmm. I think from a positive psychology perspective, my research interest predominantly had been in trying to understand how people have faced difficult circumstances, but yet have managed to be okay. And so that includes people who've experienced uh, traumas, life-threatening events. Um, it also means people who um, have been in sort of high burnout vocations and even students who are going into those kind of vocations. And again, it's, it's all about this idea of how can we move beyond just surviving and actually learn how to thrive. Mm -hmm. And of course, another aspect that you work on is um, about death anxiety. And that, of course, is the reason why I invited you, because I think this is very relevant um, in the middle of the crisis that we're going through. So just um, give us what, um, an idea what is actually death anxiety. Okay. Um, death anxiety uh, can be understood from a variety of different kind of perspectives and theories and so on. So, so a lot of people will talk about death anxiety as a very basic concept, which is, you know, ultimately, if we have a reminder of our mortality, if there's something that threatens our existence or gives us um, a, an opportunity to really face the fact that we're not going to live forever, um, how do we respond to that? Is there anxiety that we experience? Do we avoid that? You know, and, and so there's kind of a whole way of understanding that. From a theoretical perspective, again, there's different ways of understanding death anxiety, but um, I really enjoy some of the writings within existential uh, psychology, which are drawn strongly from existential philosophy. And one of the aspects of existential philosophy is that we all must face our own mortality. We all must face the fact that we uh, are not going to live forever. And how do we respond to that? How do we deal with that? Do we respond in terror or do we respond by choosing to live life? And I think that's kind of the the premise of existential psychology is helping to enable people to live life and to live life fully. So death anxiety is something, again, that can be very simply understood as the fear of death and the impact that that fear of death has on people. But from perhaps a broader perspective, death anxiety can also mean 
you know, for human beings who have not only this ability to, to be conscious of our existence and to be conscious of our lives, but also to be aware of the threats and the things that can happen to us, not just in the immediate, but even potential threats or hypothetical threats, how do we balance those two things together? That, that desire to survive, that instinct to survive, but also the awareness that life sometimes doesn't go the way we think it's gonna be. Sometimes there's awful things that happen. Sometimes there's things that happen to us or to people that we care about. And so there's a, there's a tension between those two. And I think that's kind of what interests me about death anxiety. And so some of my research in the past has been about people who've experienced traumatic events or life-threatening events. And how has that death anxiety impacted not just the potential of post-traumatic stress disorder, or not just the potential of what we would call psychiatric comorbidities, which are mental illnesses that go alongside that PTSD. Mm -hmm. But does that death anxiety in any way get regulated by other aspects of ourselves? And can it actually have a positive impact on our mm -hmm. lives as well? So that's, that's a, a little bit about, I think, death anxiety and why it's of interest to me. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you earlier mentioned about um, terror and terror management. Um, now, of course, um, it will be more relevant if you could just talk about um, terror management theory in the face of pandemic. So could you just um, expand on that? Sure. So, so moving beyond just death anxiety and kind of the, the existential perspective, terror management theory is a theory that uh, was first kind of developed from some of the ideas of an anthropologist named Ernest Becker. And as Ernest Becker suggested that Again, we have that terror, that existence, or that awareness of our existence might end and our mortality. And what things can we do to try to manage that terror? And one of the things he suggests is, of course, there are some things that allow us to extend our mortality, or to kind of extend our lives beyond the grave. And so probably an easy one to identify would be religion. And that religion exists, according to Ernest Becker, as a way of extending our mortality. Most religious perspectives have a, a kind of a perspective on the afterlife or some type of sense of joining something that's bigger than ourselves. And Becker suggested that we all are looking for that bigger thing, the thing that is beyond us, the thing that is going to last longer than we will. And so Becker mm -hmm. really suggested that there was some uh, interesting ways that we can do that. Not only is it as simple as religion, but there are things that we do that allow us to connect to something larger than who we are. Even the fact that we're doing these kind of uh, podcasts and YouTube videos and, and Facebook and everything else that we do. Um, one of the ways that Becker sees that, and I think this expands then into the terror management theory idea, is that we engage in things that kind of allow us to exist. You know, I, you know, each and every one of us probably has hundreds, if not thousands of selfies and pictures of ourselves now online, things that we're doing, things that we're eating, everything else. We're putting our lives online. And Becker would see that as a way to extend our mortality. Terror management theory took some of Becker's ideas and said, okay, is it possible then that this denial of our existence could have negative, or denial of our uh, kind of the end of our existence or the denial of our mortality could have negative consequences on people? Are there things that they might do to kind of buffer against that death anxiety so that it doesn't, of course, cause them that terror? And of course, terror management theory became very popular after September 11th, because what they noticed is that, um, of course, after September 11th happened, you know, we had constant footage, kind of like we do today with the coronavirus, but constant mm -hmm. footage of death and destruction and horrible things happening and people suffering. And so there was this heightened awareness of death. And so terror management theory emerged kind of as a way to try to understand why were people starting to respond in certain ways? Um, as an American living in the States at the time, um, I, I was amazed at how many people had American flags up in the windows, on their cars. You, if you didn't have an American flag lapel pin, it mm -hmm. was sort of like, well, what's wrong with you? So there was this surge in nationalism. There was also a surge in, of course, religious activities and so on, but also terror management theory says that when, when something is scary, we tend to look for something that's bigger by ourselves, whether it's the government or perhaps in the case today, with the NHS. Of course, we want to applaud and, and, and be supportive of the NHS, but we create these kind of structures that are larger than ourselves that give us a sense that we're going to be okay and things are going to be all right. And, and we, we, we tend to immortalize them because literally 
We, we want them to be bigger than ourselves. We want them to kind of keep us safe. And terror management theory has done a variety of different kinds of studies and things. And, and there's some great books out there around terror management. But they've done studies, for example, what happens when people are given death prompts? How does their behavior change? So they'll test people like even walking past a graveyard. And you can see things like uh, even greater senses of self-esteem, uh, a greater sense of believing in authority figures, a greater sense of nationalism, and so on. And so again, it's this idea that we, we are uncomfortable with death. And so therefore we look to things to try to help us to navigate that terror. Um, and, and terror management theory's sort of message to us all is that instead of unconsciously dealing with the terror of death, we should actively face it and deal with it and talk about it and cope with, cope and, and kind of explore it and have open conversations about death and, and that they really suggest that conscious experience of talking about death is something that's incredibly healthy for us. So that's the gist of terror management theory. Mm -hmm. Now, um, well, while you were talking about terror management, you mentioned something about heightened awareness, which actually um, mm -hmm. reminds me of um, two German medical researchers. And um, um, I don't know if you've heard about Dr. Wolfgang Waldarg and Dr. Sucharit um, Bhakti. Um, basically, what they're saying is that um, we're, we're just have a heightened awareness of um, the coronavirus as as um, as a pandemic, and so we we kind of like overreacting. And also in Britain, mm -hmm. there's another pathologist, um, Dr. Jandi, and he's actually saying the same thing that um, the coronavirus is not nothing really special, but we're kind of overreacting into it. Um, of course, I understand that this is actually beyond the realm of your expertise, but I suppose what I want to what I want to talk to you in particular is how contagious anxiety is, because you know we can't really argue whether coronavirus is really something to be you know concerned about. But um, from from a psychological standpoint, um, talk us through um, how contagious anxiety is, or perhaps um, something about panic. Okay. So I think, I think it's important to kind of differentiate three terms then uh, mm -hmm. and some of the things that you've just said is first is fear, mm -hmm. the second is anxiety, and the third is panic. Mm -hmm. um, all of us as, uh, as people, as the species, as humans, even in the animal kingdom, um, we are making threat assessments. You know, so we are trying to understand kind of what in our environment could potentially cause us to experience harm or perhaps even to be, to be killed. And so as, as a species, we, we've gotten really good at identifying the things that are deadly. And so we're making this kind of assessment. And so fear is an emotion that allows us to have this kind of heightened sense of a threat assessment, but also with a behavioral response. Um, it allows us again to kind of identify what is a threatening situation or, or, or a threatening incident and to come up with a response, which again, you know, for all of us who have taken basic biology, we know that as humans and as most uh, animals in the animal kingdom experience, we have fight or flight. And so of course we have this response to a threat. And so fear in and of itself is an incredibly adaptive and, and necessary thing for us to experience. Um, I've had clients before who have said to me, you know, Dr. Holtroff, can you please take away my fear? I, I, you know, get rid of it. And I say, okay, well, two things you need to know. Number one is I'll probably need a spoon. I'll need to go in and scoop out part of your brain because of course, this is a biological process that you were designed to have and that allows you to stay alive. And secondly, if I take away this process that allows you to stay alive, you're probably gonna die. Because when you don't have fear and you don't have that ability to acknowledge threats that are out there, that decreases your chances of survival. And so fear is not a bad thing. Anxiety is something that goes beyond fear, though. Anxiety is this kind of thing that suggests that, well, actually, our fear response is, is perhaps not based on a direct threat or a specific thing that could potentially harm us or cause us problems. It is something that has to do with a belief system or perhaps a perspective or uh, an exaggeration of the threat. And so it's almost as if we're experiencing anxiety over something that is not directly uh, threatening us. We're experiencing a level of fear that is not correlating to the things that are around us, the potential threats. So if I see a tiger, if a tiger walked into your room right now, Dennis, and, and, 
and uh, you know crawled up behind you, I would expect you to scream and run. I would not encourage you to try to fight. I would encourage you to choose the flight option and to run. That is a appropriate response to a threat. But if you're imagining, you're sitting in your bed and you're wondering, I wonder if there's a tiger outside. You know, I'm living in England and I think maybe there's a tiger outside. Well, that, that's probably not the case. It's, it's, that's an exaggerated fear response to something that is not directly threatening you. And so anxiety can be things that, you know, aren't even existing. They're, they're potential things that we imagine. We, we imagine what could happen to us if we were to get sick. We imagine what happened if we lost our job. And we, we reflect upon things that could occur, not things that are actually happening. And that, so anxiety goes beyond just the, the level of fear. Now, panic is something very specific, actually. Panic is when the anxiety becomes so overwhelming that we're unable to concentrate, we're unable to think, we're unable to deal with you know, basic issues around life. Um, and, and you often hear about a panic attack and people who experience a panic attack is, is something where they, they are literally experiencing what it would like to be threatened to die. You know, that their life is in jeopardy. They experience the heart rate, the blood pressure, the palpitations, everything about their body is preparing for that attack. And so they will describe that as, as very real. Um, the problem is now that when we talk about fear, anxiety, and panic, now we're, we're really having to do with the judgment. So if you respond to something and I say, well, you know, don't panic, Dennis, you know, you're, you're panicking too much here. You need to relax. My estimate is that you shouldn't be that scared. And so, you know, we'll tell people to not panic because we think, well, there's nothing to worry about. And so panic is an incredibly subjective experience, but it is contagious. It is something that can frighten people. Mm -hmm. um, if your threat assessment, if I went to, um, went to ASDA and I walked around and I saw, uh, you know, well, there's some things missing, you know, so the produce is not much, you know, fruit and veg. Oh, I noticed there's not a lot of uh, toilet paper left or loo roll that it seems to be running short. I might get nervous about that. Mm -hmm. But if I suddenly kind of got a sense that everybody else was nervous about that, it reinforces that this is a real threat. This is a real problem. We're all going to run out of loo roll here. Mm -hmm. And so people began to what's called panic buy because they maybe they wouldn't even have thought that, well, loo roll is a thing that I needed. But when you start hearing that everybody's getting it and there's none left, you begin to realize, wait a minute, this is a legitimate threat. This is a legitimate problem I have to face. And so it can absolutely be contagious. If a message is sent out that this is a threat and you need to be frightened of it, mm -hmm. it catches on. And we see people act in incredibly irrational ways and you know, ways that are completely illogical because they caught on to this threat. And we see loads of different kinds of things out there. People being afraid of things that they don't need to be afraid of. People being afraid of vaccines. People being afraid of the government necessarily spying on them. People being afraid of all sorts of different things. Um, is there some truth behind some of those fears? Perhaps. But to the extent that we experience it, that's when we start talking about this over-exaggerated panic and, and, and really an anxiety that is not congruent to the actual threats around us. Now, um, another thing is, um, while, while, um, we have, while, while we're in the middle of coronavirus, I've actually been collecting videos um, to make them into a compilation of uh, a video uh, where uh, mental health experts such as yourself are giving tips mm -hmm. on how to manage their mental health and well-being during this crisis. And one of the recurring themes that people tend to mention is you know resilience so what i'd like to find out is that how does resilience come into play in relation to this crisis we're going through okay um resilience in a lot of ways could be best described as bouncing back mm -hmm. so so we have something that that uh, hurts us or causes us a problem or causes us suffering could be a, a, a health issue could be a, a life issue a circumstance that we experience we, you know, we lose our job, we lose, we lose our partner, we lose somebody who we care about, we find out a bad diagnosis, we find out that we've you know, lost our job, whatever it is, that there's something that has been you know, difficult. Well, does that difficulty define you and define your experience completely? As in, now I am a victim, I am somebody who has um, been hurt, and I'm going to live in this consistently. Mm -hmm. Resilience is not saying that those things aren't true. 
or that it didn't hurt you or that it wasn't painful to lose somebody you care about or to experience a devastating health diagnosis or you know these are all legitimate real pains but resilience is the ability to bounce back despite of that pain in a sense that even though we've had a traumatic event let's say so there's a there's a type of uh, uh, research literature out there called uh, post-traumatic growth theory and post-traumatic growth says yes of course people who experience a trauma could develop PTSD and have post-traumatic stress disorder and have all the you know the, the very devastating effects of post-traumatic stress disorder and, and that is a reality however in addition to PTSD or maybe instead of PTSD people can respond to trauma and difficulty with growth they can have a greater appreciation of the relationships that they have which I think you're seeing these days with people you know phoning and calling and getting back in touch with with friends and family um, we can have an appreciation of our strengths you know the abilities that we have um, mm -hmm. we can have an appreciation of a, a level of spirituality or, or purpose in life something that is bigger than ourselves and, and so we can respond in a positive way so resilience in a lot of ways is saying yes these things are damaging and hurtful but it doesn't mean that we have to fare worse afterwards mm -hmm. We can go through that pain, we can go through that challenge, but we can actually come out the other side of it a stronger person. Mm -hmm. And wh why is it that some people seem to be born with the ability to overcome setbacks, which relative is, but some people seem to be scrambling to increase their resilience? Mm. Well, one of the theories that kind of fits within a, a resilience idea is one called psychological capital. And there's two aspects of psychological capital that I think are really um, telling of the question that you've just asked, which has to do with almost this uh, individual characteristic that some people seem to have and some people don't. Um, psychological capital really says that uh, one of the ways that we, 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 we grow and we thrive is, first of all, that we have a, an, a hopeful perspective and that we, we look towards the future and we look for uh, what's going to happen in our, in our, towards our benefit. We look towards the goals that we want to achieve and we think about how we want to grow. And of course, the second aspect of psychological uh, capital um, that, that is very similar to hope is optimism. That of course, optimism doesn't mean that we negate or, or ignore the, the negative things in life, but it's about choosing to also focus on, if not maybe even more, some of the positive aspects of life and some of the positive aspects of our experience. Now, there is no doubt that when we look at the genetic research that some people are born with very positive kind of personality characteristics. They tend to be, you know, optimistic. They tend to see things from a future perspective. They don't dwell on the past. Mm -hmm. um, they may be very highly motivated individuals and so on. And so absolutely, there are people who, like you say, kind of seem to be born that way. They just seem to be born with that ability mm -hmm. to bounce back and to, to move forward. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's it's not something that you can learn you know some of us and i am definitely not included in this some mm -hmm. of us are included kind of have almost a genetic predisposition to be lean and muscular and healthy and you know we don't really have to work out that much we don't have to watch what we eat too much we we just kind of look good and have that that certain physique then the rest of us can't do that we can't just eat what we want and work out once in a while we have to be incredibly conscious of the things that we choose to do. So genetically, we may not be blessed that way, but that doesn't mean that we all can't live a healthy lifestyle and even achieve a, a level of aesthetic and health among our bodies that, you know, is again, maybe not naturally inclined, but if you work hard enough, you can get there. And so everybody has that, even if you're not born uh, as, a, as an optimist, everybody has that possibility. But I think it's important to also acknowledge one other thing is that in addition to genetics, there are certain cultural variations to things like optimism um, or even a, a sort of a hopeful future focused perspective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certain cultures uh, may not necessarily see optimism as as an American having moved to the UK. Oftentimes what I have been told and, and, and what I um, kind of consistently told is that, well, you know, that's not really the British way. You know, we're, we're, we're pessimists. You know, we we tend to see the negative. We like to moan. We like to gripe about things. We like to complain. That's that's our thing. And so sometimes you might have some cultural variations to what optimism looks like. But even in the midst of a certain culture, which has sort of a 
perhaps a slightly more pessimistic viewpoint or critical viewpoint, there are people within those cultures and there's individuals who choose to thrive, who choose to flourish, who choose to see the positive, who choose to work on solutions and not just focus on problems. And those are the people who tend to thrive and those are the people who tend to be resilient. Now, you mentioned about the genetic component and uh, cultural component in relation to, you know, um, having the ability to overcome setbacks. But uh, how about um, personality? How, how does it um, affect how you cope and what can you do about it? Well, when it, specifically in regards to kind of coping, I think mm -hmm. there's, there are some aspects of personality that have to do with for example, one of the things that we look at in sort of a genetic understanding of personality is something called the five factor approach. Mm -hmm. and, and the five factors looked at a variety of different kinds of things. One of them being kind of introversion and extroversion. Mm -hmm. um, people who are extroverts tend to rely and, and develop relationships as a way to cope and to manage. And so the relationships that they choose and the environments that they choose to be in actually help them to be more resilient, but also specifically help them be more positive. If we surround ourselves with people who are, in a sense, that kind of person who tends to be optimistic or who tends to be solution focused rather than problem focused, well, those relationships can really benefit us. People who are introverts tend not to rely quite as much on that relational world, although they still, you know, they can't be isolated forever. They can't, you know, be in a basement by themselves in a dark room. They still need to connect with people. But in addition to some of the relationships helping them provide the optimism, there are people who kind of reflect in a way that potentially could be optimistic or negative. They tend to spend a lot of time, you know, time being very intrapersonal in the sense they, there's, there's a strong inner world for them. And for me, for example, I am an introvert. And so I like relationships and I like connection, but I need that alone time in order to cope. But that also means then I have to be conscious from my own personality, not to get stuck into a kind of gloom and doom type thinking where I just am very negative about things. And, and I've had those experiences several times, even this week, of feeling, even this morning, of waking up and feeling just really negative and feeling really down or feeling kind of, you know, very pessimistic. And there's some choices that I have to make just even within my own thinking. So personality definitely can, you know, it, it could affect how we cope and specific how we embrace things like optimism. But again, this is something that is applicable to everybody, regardless of their personality. Mm -hmm. And b based from your own research, um, can, can you tell us some ways in which we can develop resilience? Okay. Um, some, of the, some of the research that I have done, even if we go back to death anxiety, which again, I think in the face of people talking so much about a pandemic and, and, and really facing, I think, potentially a significant level of suffering, or at least a lot of news about that suffering, is that death anxiety is probably going to emerge for, for many of us, that, that, that fear. Some of the research that I have done has looked at, well, how, how do we kind of navigate and, and mediate that death anxiety so it doesn't have such an impact on our well-being? One of the things that I found, and I think, again, is, is really interesting, is the role of self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is a term that you know, a lot of people have heard of, um, or you know, they may think about self-esteem or self-respect or self-image, um, but I'm not sure we fully understand what self-efficacy is. Self-efficacy isn't thinking that you know, I'm so great or that you know, I'm a wonderful person, or you know, I, you know, I'm valuable, or so on. Those are important things, but that's not really what self-efficacy is. You know, Albert Bandura was one of the first to really try to pioneer and promote this idea of self-efficacy. He defined self-efficacy as a belief, that it was a belief that we have the tools, the skills, the talents, and the ways of creating solutions for any problems that come our way. Mm -hmm. And self-efficacy is this idea that, yes, problems exist. Yes, life is tough, but we can get through it and we have the skills to get through it. And there is that self-belief that, you know what, if it gets difficult, if it gets challenging, I can do this. Maybe not on my own. I might have to rely on friends and family and people and support and governments and NHS and whoever else, mm -hmm. but I can do this. I, 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 I have the ability to get through this. It's almost like being, optimist, being optimistic about your own strengths. And, and that seems to be one of these things that helps people 
to deal with some of the challenges that they face. It allows them to be more resilient, is that, is that level of self-efficacy. Now, of course, aside from being a researcher, you're also a parent. So I'm interested to hear um, what advice um, you would give us, um, you would give parents on how we can talk to children about pandemic. Okay. Um, one of the things is that, um, you know, as we've said before, even if we, if, you know, kind of using the example of post-traumatic growth, trauma, scary things, difficult things um, can be difficult. They can hurt us. They can challenge us but they don't have to be something that stops us from living. It doesn't have to be something that stops us from, from kind of experiencing life. And one of the things I would say to, to uh, kids, especially whether younger or adolescents is that, you know, I think everyone's at first when they're, when they're kids, they're excited about the idea of no school. You know, it's like school's been, you know, we're on lockdown and schools are closed and I get to, to be at home and I, I can sit on my Xbox or watch Netflix and I, this is gonna be great. But after about a week, and at least this has been my experience with my kids, that wears off pretty quick. And now it's the, I'm bored. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is, this, I hate this. Mm -hmm. Then is the opportunity to start thinking about, well, I'm missing out on seeing my friends. I'm missing out on going to school. I'm missing out on uh, taking my exams or missing out on birthday parties or you know, everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think children are starting to kind of get to this sense of, oh, this is actually quite a, a shocking reality that we're, we're in our homes and we can't see our friends and we can't connect in the way that we used to. What I would say to, to kids is that first of all, yeah, this is an incredibly difficult challenge, but this is also an opportunity. This is also a chance for you to do some things that you wouldn't normally do because you would be busy going to school or seeing friends. Like this is an opportunity to learn new skills, maybe learn the language, learn how to cook, learn how to dance, learn, learn something, that this is an opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I keep trying to tell even my own children is like, well, what do you want to learn? What, if you were to, you know, let's say we're in this for 12 weeks or more, we don't, we don't really know how long we're going to be, uh, be in this kind of social distancing and social isolation. You have this time now. What, what would you want to do with all this time? You have this incredible gift of time. Let's think of a goal for you. You know, what is something you'd like to learn? What is something you'd like to grow in? And so I think to tell kids, both young and old, that, okay, this is a chance for you to do something. Let's, let's try it out. Yeah, this isn't fun. This is, not, this is not great. I'm sorry you had to miss your birthday party. And we'll try to, to figure out something later as a way to celebrate that. But in the now, right now, what can we do with this time? And look at it as a gift. Um, second thing I would tell uh, kids, and especially younger children, for, as this is specifically for parents, is I think a lot of parents, when, when kids are scared, their response is to kind of, you know, like say, well, you don't need to be scared. You don't need to worry, you know, and to try to minimize it, or you're not scared, or even completely dismiss it. There's nothing to be scared about. And that's just not true. Kids are smart enough to, to sense that, well, the adult is scared, and, and maybe I should be scared too. What I would say to parents is first and foremost is that don't you experience fear and then tell your kids not to. Don't, you know, don't have you be someone who is frightened and then expect your children not to pick up on that. You know, when I used to fly with my children um, and we hit some turbulence as, at, on a plane, one of the first things they do is they would look towards me to see, should I be scared? And, and of course, if I looked scared, they would be scared. If I was like, it's okay, this is part of flying, this is normal then they could calm down a little more. So they look toward their parents to see how, how they should react. In fact, the funny thing about flying too is that, um, you know, if you, if you ever flown and the, the air masks have dropped, one of the things it tells parents to do is you put on your mask first because you're not gonna help anybody if you're passed out from a lack of oxygen. You're not gonna help yourself or your children. So you've got to take care of yourself. And one of the message I would say to parents is that first, you need to be able to understand your own levels of fear and have a chance to talk through it and to cope with it. Mm -hmm. That will then provide a beacon of hope to your children. Mm -hmm. And then what you say to your children is something along these lines. When they get scared and when they get nervous and they see the stories or they hear things on the news or, or whatever it is, you say to kids, look, I, I can't promise that everything's going to be okay. Anyone who tells you everything's going to be okay is, is an idiot because the likelihood that everything is always gonna be okay is probably not true. Mm. We can see from examples that there are things that are awful that happen, that are terrible. So everything is not gonna be okay. But 
they can be okay in the sense that as a parent, I will do everything possible to make sure that you're okay. There are people who have committed their lives, doctors and researchers and scientists, to make sure that they're going to be okay. There are teachers who have invested in their lives to make sure they're okay. There's family, there's friends. There are so many people who want them to be okay that we're all gonna try our hardest to make sure that you're okay. So I can't promise that everything's gonna be okay, but I can promise just even for myself as a parent that I will do everything possible for you uh, mm -hmm. and, and to protect you and keep you safe. Now, I would also like to find out what's your other research interests. Um, obviously, you've done a lot of work on resilience and post-traumatic growth, but what other um, interests you have, um, other research interests? Well, it's interesting because I think uh, some of the research interests that I have, and I think for a lot of academics and researchers that are out there, we're having to face kind of, well, you know, things have shifted a bit globally, you know, in the sense of what, what, what we can do, face-to-face -face research is, is beginning to diminish, at least, you know, even at our university, we're not conducting any face-to-face -face research for, you know, potentially six months. And so we're, we're telling students and the academics and researchers, you've got to think of new and novel ways of, of creating uh, studies. So for me, I think what I'm interested in specifically is the role of education in helping to promote um, things like psychological capital, resilience and strengths as a way to help people who are potentially at risk um, of vulnerability, and that includes younger people, uh, high, high uh, stress careers, and so on. But, but I have an interest in saying what role can education, what role are um, perhaps novel uh, ways of communicating, whether it's through uh, social media or whether it's through online platforms, what ways can we help to promote resilience using those things? And so um, I'm very interested also specifically in academic communities, specifically among students at university. How, because you know we, we have loads of research again focusing somewhat on the negative of how difficult first year university is and how many students face mental illness and potentially even suicide and so on yeah. well how is it that we help them to thrive then and grow and so some of my research interests are changing in the sense that i really want to understand a bit more about the academic community and and ways of assisting students and, and, and new career professionals in becoming more resilient instead of just focusing on the burnout around those careers or how tough university is how can we actually encourage them to thrive in those settings mm -hmm. i I've, I've actually like what you said you know like focusing on the good bits on encouraging people how to thrive um if i could just briefly mention i'm actually organizing an event um it, we're expecting it to be in October. I don't know if we have to move this in light of the coronavirus. And I've actually invited just one of the speakers and the event is called Good Mental Health 2020. And the main thrust of that event is that, you know, when we talk about mental health, we should also highlight, you know, areas where we could actually promote good mental health. But for anyone who is listening, um, we'll, we'll update you um, about the progress of the event and if we have to reschedule it. But um, what I would also like to um, ask you is, as, as an expert on mental health, can you tell us some, some of the myths on mental health that you've come across? Um, well, I think there's quite a few myths actually mm -hmm. about uh, um, mental health in general. I think probably one of the most dangerous ones that I think of, and again, this is, it's becoming less and less, but, but one that I still see occasionally, is that if you allow people to talk about um, anything that's bothering them or any of their concerns, that somehow that reinforces it and makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, you know, this one of the, the clearest examples is that sometimes, especially for adolescents, um, they will face thoughts around suicide. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that is very common and is something that is, uh, you know, unfortunately is a reality for, for some adolescents in the fact that they do end up taking their own lives. So, so mm -hmm. suicide is a real thing in their world. Mm -hmm. And so I, I've heard before schools and adults and individuals say things like, well, don't talk to the kids about that. Don't, don't mm -hmm. let, you know, adolescents or teenagers know about that or even, even have the chance, shut that conversation down. Because if you, if you engage in that or you kind of acknowledge it, it's going to gain power and then there'll be a rash of suicides and suddenly it's going to seem good. And, um, you know, of course, we had a, a variety of different kinds of debates around you know, the, the implementation of suicide prevention programs. And one of the fears was, well, if you talk about suicide or you talk about mental illness, 
with adolescents, they're going to jump on that because they're attention seekers and they kind of just believe anything you tell them and, the, and they will adopt that for themselves. Um, I, I think that's a, a really dangerous myth that's out there and, and unfortunately still exists in certain circles and, and, and people have this, you know, this perspective that we shouldn't talk. I say, you know, it, it's not about, you know, in a sense, making someone think about something. They're already thinking about it. Adolescents are already thinking about things like suicide. We didn't give them this idea. It's there. But if we don't give them the space and the opportunity to talk about it, well, then they're having to cope and manage and think about it from their own perspective. And, and you know, adolescents have had a limited worldview and limited life experience. And so they don't know how to cope as well as perhaps adults do. So it's important to talk through these things. I think that's a, a significant uh, sort of issue around mental health that we haven't faced legitimately as a, as a culture and as people, we, we need to continue to talk. And with the pandemic, for example, even the word pandemic and, and virus and stuff, I think it's very easy to kind of say, oh, this is overblown. This is too much. And, and maybe it is. You know, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a, I have no idea, in a sense, I have to listen to the experts like anybody else. But the fear around this, the, the, the anxiety around this, perhaps even the panic around this is real. It's there. We may not think it should be there. We may think it's an overblown reaction, but it's there. Mm -hmm. So what do we do about it? We talk about it. We, we, we get to a place where we can have conversations, the conversation that you and I are having. These kinds of things need to be happening for people. All right, if you're afraid of it, let's talk through it. Let's discuss it. What, what, what are you worried about? What are we imagining happening here? What does this mean about your life? What does this mean about the fear of your own death, perhaps? Mm -hmm. You know, have these conversations that are important to have. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of us who are interested to explore more about resilience, um, can you recommend some excellent resources or books, perhaps, to learn more about this topic? Sure. I think that there's a variety of different kinds of sources that are out there. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, when we, oftentimes when people ask about resilience, what they're asking to some degree is, you know, do you have any ways of coping, you know, things that, to help me cope? And, and there are many different books and, and, and things about coping. But, but actually, I think resilience goes beyond just coping. And, and, and it's about choosing to flourish, as I said. An excellent starter that I think, again, speaks to resilience and uh, um, is uh, authored by the name of Martin Seligman. And Martin Seligman wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. And if you're interested in learning more about this idea of flourishing and thriving, I think that's an excellent place to start. Mm -hmm. I think looking at Martin Seligman's work is, is, is you know, very powerful. He, it, the book says authentic happiness. And think, well, what does that have to do with resilience? Well, again, if we take that perspective, that pursuing authenticity and pursuing growth and pursuing pot potential and possibility is is not just coping with negative events, it's allowing even some of those challenges to promote us to do that, to be the motivation to do that. To, that difficulties and challenges and hardships are not just things that need to be managed, but they are f fuel for our growth. I, I think Martin Seligman is an excellent resource. I think if you're interested, I was talking about self-advocacy before, um, Albert Bandura has written several different books about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but even, you know, looking specifically um, again, as someone who is from a positive psychology perspective, there are lots of different kinds of resources around positive psychology. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, Ernest Becker talked about uh, death anxiety and there's terror management theory all over the place. These are all easily Googleable, Google, Googleable if that's a word, yeah. things. Uh, and, and I strongly encourage people if they're interested in that and taking a look. And so um, if you want as well, there might be some links that you can post on this video uh, in well. the description if people would like to read more. Okay. And what's one thing about mental health that you think we should be talking more about? I think one of the things that we should be talking more about with mental health is, and this might be a bit strange based on what I've been saying about this kind of very strong positive approach, but I think that we need to start having some real discussions as people about how do we evaluate and understand the information that we're getting about things like mental health. Okay, so, so you are interviewing me. I, I've said that I have done research. I've said that I'm a lecturer at a university. So I, I'm playing the authority card. And so, so people will perhaps believe me because they think that I'm an authority on something. Mm -hmm. It's really important when it comes to issues that are so important to human existence, like mental well-being and, 
mental health and dealing with mental illness, that you don't just take the word of authorities, that you don't mm -hmm. just take the word of people because they seem like experts. Mm -hmm. um, if you try to Google or even searching on YouTube or searching online for, for ways of achieving mental health, you will see some overlap, but you'll also see some very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So as a consumer of mental health and, and psychological information, how do you start to know how to trust that? Mm -hmm. And I think a conversation we need to be having as people is, well, how do we understand evidence? How do we understand where the evidence lies? I've been talking about all these different kinds of things. I, I could be completely full of it. You know, this could be just my opinion. And so I don't want you or anyone else to believe me. I want people to go out and investigate this for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so to start understanding a little more about what does the evidence say. Now, it's important then for people when they're trying to figure out, well, how can I improve my life? How can I understand a bit about um, achieving my goals and so on? Not just to, to type on the first blog that they find mm -hmm. or, or something that they've seen on Facebook or a YouTube video or anything else but to really start learning about how to engage with critical thinking and, and really gathering research about ideas. Um, I, I, I'm really concerned about kind of the, the, the social media impact on people's perceptions around loads of different things, you know, forget mental health, but loads of different things. At what point do we stop and just even think critically about it? Thinking, you know, there's loads of different uh, kind of uh, resources for critical thinking, but how do we evaluate and gather evidence? How do we go to the source of something and really determine, is this a legitimate study or not? Mm -hmm. and, and do we really understand the idea of the preponderance of evidence? So one of the things that happens is that someone will say, I've got this new approach to doing something, to weight loss, to mental health, to whatever, getting rich, and it's my idea, it's this new unique thing. Well, that's great, but what does most of the, the researchers and scholars say about this? Mm -hmm. And so that's wonderful that there might be this kind of new idea and, and we need mm -hmm. to look at it more, but what does the, what is the, you know, the scientific community think as a whole? Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to understand a bit more about not just grabbing the things that, you know, kind of, um, buy into our own beliefs, you know, mm -hmm. as we call this attributional bias, that we tend mm -hmm. to look for evidence that confirms what we already believe. Mm -hmm. Well, a good scientist, and I think, you know, uh, we've got a variety of different kinds of people who say that as human beings, we're kind of all scientists gathering evidence and understanding it. We need to test it out. We can't just try to look for positive evidence that reinforces our beliefs, but really look at all the different evidence and, and mm -hmm. be open-minded. I think one of the most important things about mental health and well-being for people is that they're open-minded about what the evidence says, what the research says, what, what, what is kind of what we're understanding about health and mental health specifically, mm -hmm. and to, to look at it and not be just looking for things that confirm what we believe. For example, I'll give you one last thing. Um, how many studies did you see that showed that Facebook and social media were causing depression? And it was in newspapers and so on saying, oh, this is a problem, this is a big problem, People are not connecting. People are not doing face-to-face. -face. We're all stuck on our phones. And, and you saw a significant amount of negative attention about social media and, and mental illness. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? In today's world, the people who use and understand social media are the ones who are going to thrive. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they've been preparing for this for 20 or 30 years. And now in this sort of lockdown world that we have, they're going to be all right because they know how to connect with people online. Mm -hmm. For people who are doing this for the first time, this is going to be a struggle. This kind of world of, of such isolation is going to be hard. So be critical about those kinds of studies and think, well, wait a minute, you know, wh what's really being said here? I think that's a really important thing for everybody to consider. And I, I think what's also important to understand is that because psychology is not really an exact science. So, you know, one, one, you know, concept might be true for a certain generation. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will still be carried out as, as truth um, for, for the next few decades. And yeah, I, I'd like to, you know, um, highlight what you've just said that, that it's important for us to, you know, have varied sources when we're consuming, um, whether it's psychology or whether it's current events. I, I think that's really important. Now, I'd like to um, ask you a slightly personal question. So um, aside from mental health, what are your other interests? Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do is to reflect upon what do I want to do with this time? Mm -hmm. and, and what do I want to do with my own growth? And I think for me, like uh, today, for example, I just signed up 
for a, a cooking class to learn how to cook healthy food and and because I, I really you know I, I cook a little bit but not very much and so we tend to have a lot of processed food that's not very good for us and so one of the things for me personally is I want to grow a little more understand about how to be healthy uh, not just for my own health which I, I need to do um, as I do have some underlying health conditions that need to be sorted out as I'm getting closer to turning 50 um, but also just how do I help promote health among my family and that's something that I've, I want to take some time during this perspective to really to to really explore that a little bit so healthy eating exercise all that sorts of stuff um, I also have a real interest personally and uh, again this is something where I kind of reveal how nerdy and geeky I am mm -hmm. um, but I also have a lot of interest in things like science fiction and fantasy and so on so um, I've always watched the, those kinds of films and you know I have Pretty much every streaming online service you can you can have and i loved watching films but but to me i think for me that that kind of fantasy world is is really exciting and mm. and i i want to understand a bit more about that i'd love to write on that kind of i maybe potentially even create something but but really even think about this kind of other world that i that i absolutely love to escape in and i think it's it's important for all of us to have those kinds of things again things that we can grow and, and develop new skills but also ways for us to, to disconnect. You know, there's there's a harsh reality out there that's kind of tough. And and for me, disconnecting means going off into outer space, perhaps, right? Or superheroes, or something, something out there that is that is kind of sci-fi related or action related. But but everybody can have that opportunity to escape in some way and to disconnect, and and that it's okay to do that from time to time. We we certainly need some form of escapism. Um, finally, um, what's in the pipeline, and where can we learn more about you? Um, are you on social media? Yes, I do have a a Facebook page, a business mm -hmm. page that you know, you're welcome to link here if you like. Mm -hmm. um, I I try to do some YouTube videos myself. It's one of the things that I want to get more involved with during my time is to to putting out some more content. Uh, and again, I've always said, well, I never have the time to do that. Well, now actually I have a little more focused time to create some content as well. So I have a Facebook page and a YouTube page uh, that again, I'll post the things that I'm doing as far as research, mm -hmm. uh, I'll try to do videos. And if, if people have ideas or things that they would like to hear me talk about or to be for me to explore, for mm -hmm. me to even find out, do some of that research gathering for them, I'd be mm -hmm. happy to do that. It's something that's fun for me actually and uh, I enjoy doing. So those are two ways to, to hear a bit more about me. Thank you. Well, um, Dr. Halterhoff, it's been an insightful conversation with you, but unfortunately our time is up. But thank you for sharing with us your expertise. Um, they're really um, useful, especially um, in light of the current situation. Um, I look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you. Thank you.